he said to me then, you were right. This is a very important, uh, very important potential tool and uh, it's going to affect all society, I think. But the first tremors would be felt at Harvard University. Leary had been headhunted by Harvard's psychology department in its drive for fresh minds and ideas. With Leary, it would get more than it bargained for. Teaming up with a colleague, Richard Alpert, Leary won approval for a research project exploring the potential benefits of the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, psilocybin. Leary and his project were certainly popular with graduate students. I met Tim in his tiny little cubicle office. He was very engaging, very witty, very funny. I was immediately taken by him, felt tremendous rapport. He described to me the research he was currently undertaking with the psychedelic psilocybin, and I immediately committed myself to it. I asked him what I needed to do, and he said, you just needed to participate as a subject uh, in the experiments and actually take the substance with me and, and a few other students. So I said yes. Psychedelic drugs were legal then, and most of the graduate students in psychology said yes to Leary leaving his colleagues short of research assistants. Some of the, the best and brightest students were, be, were attracted to this project, and it created a bit of jealousy and envy. Leary's boast that psychedelic drugs were the key to the unconscious mind also rankled with his fellow teachers. But one project did yield remarkable results. The Marsh Chapel experiment was designed by a graduate student under Leary's supervision. It investigated whether psilocybin, taken in a religious setting, could induce experiences comparable to those described by the great mystics. Randall Larko was one of ten theology students who took the psilocybin. I had a real struggle with the chemical, and at one point I thought, in fact, I had died and I was in hell. I began saying the Bible verse, for God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I kept repeating that over and over again and then I came to the awareness that this wasn't helping me at all. Larko fled from the chapel with Leary following. Outside his terror evaporated. It was a glorious sunny day, and I remember seeing an elderly couple walking down the sidewalk hand in hand, and that was the most profound and beautiful experience to me. This was an image of people who indeed loved one another and had lived their lives together. Everything in the world just seemed to glow inwardly with life. Everything was alive, and I don't mean just living things, but even inanimate things. They just lived and I was seeing things like I had never seen them before. Leary steered Larko back into the chapel. Nine of the ten theology students reported that they had indeed experienced something like a mystical revelation. I would say, yeah, it did change my life. The experiment had demonstrated that psychedelics could indeed open the doors of perception. But still, some of Leary's research students didn't want to take the drug themselves. Several students had come to me to complain that Leary was pressuring them to take the drug, psilocybin. Leary argued that only by taking psilocybin could his researchers understand its effect on consciousness. But much of his research was done at his Harvard home, and the line between research and pleasure blurred. His pet project on psychedelics and creativity brought a stream of artists and writers to his house, among them the poet Allen Ginsberg. Leary gave Ginsberg and his lover Peter Orlovsky the psilocybin, and Ginsberg decided that he wanted to uh, do something for world peace, and so he would call up Kennedy and Khrushchev, get them all on the phone and solve this problem about the, the bomb and everything right then and there. Um, they weren't able to get the two most powerful men on the world on the phone, so they settled for Jack Kerouac. It became difficult to maintain a balance there, and, and I should say actually we lost our balance a bit. That became less rigorous, and there was an increase in the use of, of, of psilocybin as a recreational substance. 
Harvard's controversy over psychedelic drugs now became national news. In the end, Leary's colleague, Richard Alpert, became the first professor to be fired from Harvard in almost a century for giving psilocybin to an undergraduate. When Alpert left, Leary went with him. He liked to claim that he too had been sacked. It added to his radical image. Leary and Alpert looked for the right surroundings in which to continue to spread the word about psychedelic drugs. Their saviour was Leary's close friend, Peggy Hitchcock. We went up to see if this old house might work as a haven for this little group of, of people who had sort of found themselves exiled from, from where they'd been living. And so um, we did. We saw this house and it looked like it would be just perfect. Peggy came from one of America's wealthiest families. The old house was a 64-room mansion set in 2,000 acres of upstate New York. It was owned by her brothers, and Leary lived here at Millbrook, virtually rent-free, for the next four years.